We're taking this, 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 we're We have been there ourselves. I'm Dr. George Kosmadakis, nephrologist, and today's host of ERA podcast, A Pinch of Salt. Every day in our clinical practice, we are confronted with the nutritional aspect of chronic kidney disease. We know that malnutrition is bad, even though we are not quite sure how to define it, and we are often not confident on how to treat it. In order to understand more about it, We have the honor and the pleasure to discuss with Professor Georgina Piccoli, Professor of Nephrology in Mans, France, a leading authority in renal nutrition and president of the European Renal Nutrition Working Group. Georgina, we are glad to have you with us today. Well, thank you, but don't wait too much from me because such a Such a presentation is frightening everybody. So they're asking questions. Go on. It was not my intention. Historically, before the development of dialytic therapies, renal failure was mostly treated with strict diet interventions. And it seems that dialysis would solve all the problems. But as we see, it didn't. So I will start, uh, Georgina, with a seemingly simple question, which is not that, that simple as it seems. Why do we, do we speak about diet in nephrology today? Well, nothing is more simple and more complicated than the simplest things. Let's start just defining what a diet is. In, in the Greek uh, term, it's a way of life. It's not just something that you should not eat. That is the way we, we often and probably too often consider the term diet today. Uh, as Feuerbach said, we are what we eat. And since to cite this time a song, you, get, you got to get in to get out when the kidney, so what makes things get out of the body, does not work enough, we have to pay even more attention about what we eat. And the idea of diet, I prefer the term diet because it's simpler, but some, some colleagues use nutritional approach, nutritional treatment, is more than just taking something out. Having said that, the whole story started with a genius, Thomas Addis, who was a um, a Scottish researcher that ended up to the United States in the period that we now know a little bit better, this was the period of Oppenheimer. Uh, he had a very social view of medicine and a flair for the neglected ones. And this is why he started taking care of patients with chronic kidney disease that were deemed to die and to die very badly, unpoisoned by their own body. And so he thought, well, if uremia, a term that we still use, is something linked to the, to the fact that urea that is derived from proteins is poisoning the body, if we reduce the proteins, we will at least uh, ease the, the last days of these poor people. But what happened is that people not only was a little bit better, less nausea, less vomiting as a symptom. It was a little bit better, but lived longer. And he started trying mice and he started studying and he started giving diets. And he was actually the one who uh, described first what is known now like the Brenner theory of uh, the overload, working overload on the remnant nephrons. Because he saw that proteins increased the working 
load for the kidneys, for the sick kidneys. And reducing proteins was not just uh, reducing urea, but went a little bit farther and started started using diets in a moment in, in which there was uh, there was no no other hope. Uh, why we we have this um, let's say we we tend to consider that the renal diet is a diet with very little protein, which is actually a little bit true because the it's the most specific issue of diets for chronic kidney diseases. Salt should not be in excess in in cardiac diseases and should be moderately reduced in chronic kidney disease. Not too much, but we would we, we might talk about that. Calories should be adequate in kidney diseases as in every other disease, chronic disease. So what makes things different is the attention on proteins. And of course, these diets was the, the motto diet or die were so difficult, so hard. And actually the, the modern dietetics uh, was born after the second world war. So in the fifties, Everything was really in the beginning, what was known was very little. Uh, and when finally dialysis, March 70, 60, uh, started, um, there was this idea that it was a rare disease of young people, and then dialysis would uh, help living better, and then transplantation would solve all the problems. But the story uh, went out a little bit differently. And now our populations are older. And also, we always have to remember that in two thirds, for two thirds of the world population, dialysis is not available. So we are rediscovering diets, but in a different way. We are rediscovering diets as a way to slow down the progression of kidney disease when it's possible but also to metabolically stabilize the patients. And in this regard, protein intake is what makes the renal diet a renal diet and is more specific. I hope I, un I answered yeah. this part. Well, we can yeah. talk for two days, but it's not the, the pinch of salt. Well, it's fundamental what you say about the, the low diet, the low protein diet that is reducing hyperfiltration of remnant, remnant nephrons and all these uh, uh, metabolic uh, adaptations uh, during, uh, during the, the pathophysiological process of chronic kidney disease. And, um, you know, I, I like very much when we look at the history because we, the, you, you, you see sometimes this... Uh, uh, these stages of uh, remembrance and of forgetting and uh, re-remembrance of, of some paradigms. And uh, I think, as you said, we have come back to, to, uh, to the diet as, as a solution because we have started uh, uh, realizing which are the limits of the other uh, options we have uh, in the treatment of chronic kidney disease. And, you know, and as you said, we, we talked about dialysis and, and it, it it leads me to the next to the next question. What about this dichotomy in the in the nutritional strategy, depending on the stage of chronic kidney disease? Well, it's more than a dichotomy. Is the fact that um, we tend to uh, we're slow to adapt to novelties. So, in the pre-dialysis phase, we have three magic numbers that are the normal protein intake. And this changed over time. When I was one young, it was 1.2 gram per kilogram per day, which is what is now advised for elderly people without kidney disease. Then the normal uh, protein diet, as the World Health Organization identifies it, went down in the 90s to one gram per kilogram per day of proteins. And then finally, in uh, the beginning of the new millennium, we are being more and more reasonable 
And the normal protein diet is 0.8. But we have to be aware of the fact that in the United States, the protein intake, and in Canada, the protein intake is probably more 1.2, 1.4. In France, it's probably more 1.2 in young people. And even in Italy, where we have the Mediterranean diet, is usually above one gram. So we start with a paradox that what is is not normal or what is normal if we have to uh, and then we have two magic numbers that come to diets and 0.3 for severely restricted diets but these numbers came from the 80s in which they put some poor people into the metabolic cage and studied them and studied the balance but it was when uh, erythropoietin was not yet available, treatment of acidosis was not well developed, and people were young. Uh, they were people in the 40s, 50s with glomerular diseases, so completely different from the population that we see nowadays. In that context, a series of studies identified in 0.6 the, the start of the effect, a sort of effect threshold. Forgetting the MDRD study that showed that each time you go down by more or less 0.2 grams per kilogram per day of proteins, you gain some time of dialysis. And 0.3, it was the minimum in which it was possible to achieve uh, a, a metabolic balance. So we, we kept these metric numbers, uh, but the, the idea is that if you want to stabilize the kidney function, you have to put the poor kidney in a sort of sleeping mode. And the more you decrease, the better it is, provided that you avoid malnutrition and that you see the patients well and regularly. So once dialysis is started, there was the, the myth that, wow, well, dialysis, you lose tons of proteins. Dialysis, um, the, the figures of 1.2 grams of proteins at dialysis start derives from the 70s, 80s, in which ultra pure water was not widespread. Uh, biocompatibility and, on the other hand, bioincompatibility was a very, very important issue. There was no erythropoietin, and so and so. So now the catabolic effect of dialysis is presumably lower, but our patients are more fragile. So once again, um, the 1.2 is not the Bible. There is no real study about that. It was just common sense. And then it was copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste for years and years and years. We're now speaking about trying to start dialysis in a smoother way, which is the standard of care in peritoneal dialysis, incremental dialysis, and is becoming more and more popular also on hemodialysis. So in these cases, there is no sense of taking a patient who was on a pre-dialysis phase, eating very little proteins, let's say 0.4 or 0.6, and then one day later, it's on dialysis and starts eating uh, 1.2 grams. So once more, uh, we are going in many fields of medicine towards a very personalized approach. And we should be able to do that also, uh, also with diets. There is nothing magic, uh, but just an adaptation that takes into account the state of a patient, the number of dialysis sessions, or the intensity of peritoneal dialysis, the residual kidney function. And what we 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 praise most, we want more trying to preserve the residual kidney function. Do we want more to preserve the nutritional state? One size does not fit all. So it's probably a pseudo contra contradiction is more something about 
uh, knowing what we want and choosing it face by face. So it's it's wonderful what you say because we see in more and more uh, situations that we're coming back to the personalized uh, medicine and to, to uh, the individualized approach according to the to the to the um, uh, needs of every patient. But I, I would like to to come back because uh, oh, I think a lot of a lot of colleagues who have a, a, a very big problem uh, on uh, realizing. Uh, how to uh, switch uh, from uh, uh, one protein diet limit to another and uh, how could you describe the profile of uh, every patient according to the protein profile that we need to, to, to achieve? Well, first of all, let's start again from the pre-dialysis phase. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you what we do, which is not uh, in any guideline, because there is no randomized study uh, about when to start and when to stop. The studies are how, when you define a population, you recruitment, and you, you see what happens. But we have probably more to learn from observational studies in this field. So uh, if a patient is young, and has a kidney function, function that is decreasing, is probably wise to try to adapt the diet in the very long term. And in this sense, it's better to have a vegetarian or vegan diet, or at least what we call now a plant-based diet between 0.6, 0.8 in stage, since stage two, three, and then you, redu you may reduce progressively if the kidney disease uh, goes worse. If you have a, a patient uh, with, of the age of my father who, has, uh, who is 91 years old, uh, has a kidney disease stage uh, 3B, I always make his example. He had a very, very slow progression of chronic kidney disease. I hope he will live to 120 years but we all know it's not the likest possibility. So he eats about one gram, one gram, two of proteins. What's the matter? Let's, let's let him be. Uh, if we have at, all, at any age an advanced kidney disease, it's a deal you have to make with a patient saying, well, we can change the way you eat. It may make you gain sometimes, sometimes years without dialysis. But you have to see if you're comfortable. I had patients who prefer to be on dialysis and eat all what they wanted. And it has to be respected. But very often, especially elderly people, they don't care that much about what they eat. So one can adapt, but it's not something one gives in, it's a, it's a pathway we have to, to, to go through with a patient. You reduce, you see what happens, you discuss, you adapt. Uh, the wrongest thing is I have a good dietitian. He made a very nice scheme. We, do, we give it to the patients and that's it. But it will never go. But we know it's the same, for example, with blood pressure. If we want to have a good result with blood pressure, we, we give a treatment we see if it works, we change it, we adapt. It's a yeah, little bit yeah. more complicated, but it's the same idea. So once dialysis is started, what we do, we, we start about two thirds of our patients in incremental, and we start giving more and more freedom so that when they finally are at three sessions per week, they are at least free for what regards protein knowing that it's not as easy because you have to take at that point to pay attention to phosphate, etc. And one thing that I did not tell you is that we are living in a poisoned world. So even if ultra processed food is practical, uh, it helps uh, preserving food, but it's probably very toxic for our patients. So is also very important to teach them how to cook, to, to see 
uh, that they come back to, to healthy food. And this is probably the first thing that we should have to do before, even before decreasing. You're it's talking about uh, in, in or, inorganic phosphate uh, that is contained uh, legally in the additives uh, in order to improve conservation and uh, palatability of uh, the various nutritional elements. And that is entirely absorbed and not uh, treated with uh, phosphate binders. Are, are you talking about uh, this when you, you say I'm poison? not talking only about it, even if it's in the good prosciutto italiano, there is a lot of polyphosphate. <laughs> but is phosphate, is potassium, but is also a lot of small quantities of, for example, the E. The E. Yes. Yeah. So they are. They may color. They may change the texture. Uh, they may mm, make the the food look uh, look nicer, more appetizing. Yeah. yeah. But they may be. Uh, we know very little about what they actually do, except that they can uh, get addiction uh, to mm. processed food, and probably, presumably in patients who do not have the possibility to eliminate all what is hydrosoluble because they have kidney disease, it's conceivable that their effects are even worse than in the rest of the population. So common sense is always useful. Common it sense. It's very, 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 very interesting uh, what you're saying. And, you know, Thinking about common sense, we we cannot avoid thinking about uh, the guidelines that uh, are sometimes uh, uh, a messenger of the common sense, and there, there are some contradictions in in in, in some guidelines. W would you would you like to comment a little bit on on them and uh, you know clarify? To a young nephrologist, what what would you would you say to a young nephrologist? What 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 should he read to you know to? Well, if a young nephrology, if a young nephro Italians hate guidelines, so if a young nephrologist <laughs> is Italian, I would say read the guidelines first. French people uh, adore guidelines, so <laughs> I would say um, look at the, um, look at the patients first, and maybe read some some different study first. I mean, guidelines are useful, but they are a starting point. We have two very different guidelines that are not so different when you look at them in detail. Uh, we have the Keidoki and Keidigo. So the names are so similar that I always get messed up, but uh, the, the Keidoki 2020, um, are, are just on nutrition. So this is the first big difference. They put 20 people that have knowledge on nutrition. Some of them, they are more epidemiologists of nutrition. Very few of them have a real daily life with a patient. And this has to be acknowledged. They did a fantastic work, but the implementation is not exactly what one could ask to that group. And what they did, they did a, a great job on the evaluation where you have no trials. So the, the first part of the guideline on evaluation is fantastic. The second part is based on what should be the EBM, the evidence base. Okay, great. They just put, took randomized control trials. But what do you think it's easy to randomize myself? I, I eat carrots and salad and you eat all what you want. We are randomized. It does not work. I mean, the MDRD study clearly demonstrated that prescribing a diet is not enough. And I'm, it's not me saying that is a fantastic paper that is entitled, what did actually the MDRD study show that um, underlines that interesting things of the study was to, to highlight how compliance to diet was crucial. 
And if you take PMDRD study that someone take, I did not demonstrate the diet is useless. And instead of seeing the patients per, per intention to treat, so what you prescribe, but you look at them per protocol, what they ate, then you see a difference. So randomized trials are important, but the best randomized trial is double blind. You do not know what you take, the green pill or the red pill. Uh, do you think one can do it with no. diet? No, of course. So guess how many patients are gathered in the Cochrane uh, review that is the basis for the KDOKI? We have millions, 80 millions of people with chronic kidney disease. We have 3,000 people. 3,000, just 3,000. 3, so it's not, I'm not saying throw it in the garbage can. But the message is not a message easily implemented. And the message is hyper strong. Everybody, including my dad, from if clinically stable, and thanks God my, my, my dad is stable, since stage three should be on a 0.6, 0.3 diet, very restricted, regardless of age, regardless of progression of kidney disease, just not being diabetic. So very, very strong on one side, but on a very small group of patients, which is good. But in my opinion, it means if you have the patient that corresponds to the guideline, relatively young, very good compliance, et cetera, you can go very far, but it does not say that you have to put everybody on the diet. On the other hand, you have the American uh, KDGO guidelines that were not yet published for chronic kidney disease, but were published on diabetes and says, who care? Don't ruin, don't spoil the life of a poor patient if they have just a normal protein diet, it's okay. On what? On the same literature and even not updated. So on one side, you have 1A, everybody on the diet. And on the other side, you have 2C. Well, if you really want to put someone on the diet, but who cares about meat? So uh, the, the point is that the guidelines have also to be, uh, to be uh, seen in a very critical way. And in a way, there is a very good news. We can do what we want because everything is prescribed in the guideline, everything is allowed. So we should not be scared to go very low if we have a good patient, but we should not feel guilty not to go very low if we do not have the right patient. We will always have the right guideline supporting this. I hope so, I uh, confused you enough. So we have to, to adapt ourselves to the patient and uh, that's uh, that's a wonderful you know, I, I live in a region where the mean the mean uh, protein consumption is about 1.5 grams uh, per kilogram uh, a lot of cheese and uh, and when when we get under one gram we are very proud of, of them yeah we so I, I understand what you say. Uh, but you know, there, is, uh, yeah. there is indeed um, the among the uh, re-evaluations of the MDRD study, there, there are a couple of papers. I can give you the, um, uh, the references to, to put with this webinar um, that really show that what is important is also to normalize and reduce. So if one wants to see a difference, probably you see a, a higher difference from 1.5 to 0.8 than from 0.8 to 0.6. Which is much more painful and difficult to achieve. And, uh, you know, that, that like, leads me to the, to the last question is uh, uh, whether, would you, would you have a reference list to, to propose? Yes, I will. I will share it with you, not by heart. My memory is full of holes like, uh, Swiss cheese, but I can I can write it down. Okay, so we'll have something from you. 
And now we get to the to the last general questions where we want to get to know you. And uh, the question that we ask all our uh, invited uh, personalities is, which book, luxury item, and two songs would you take with you to a desert island and why? Well, it depends upon how long should I stay on the desert island. Uh, one week, one year. <laughs> ah, it's up to you to fly. define. Uh, so, as for the book, is if not for the rest of life, I think I will take uh, all the poems of Eugenio Montale. If it's undetermined, I would probably be scared to know all of them by heart, and I will take the Bible. I will have enough to read for some for a little while. Uh, two songs. Uh, in this period of wars, I, I rediscovered Bob Dylan, so I would probably take the answer, my friend is blowing in the wind. And uh, my favorite, that is not a song, but is a music, is Zorba's Dance. <laughs> And uh, because he, he was completely crazy, and I love crazy people. <laughs> and and I think with a pinch of salt, okay, but a pinch a pinch of folly is even better. And about the the luxury item, I would take two. I would take a the best box of Windsor and Newton watercolors, artist quality, and some as much as I can take uh, Fabriano rough watercolor paper. So you also know what I do in my leisure time. Yeah, a little a bit, Bert told me you are an excellent painter as well, a homo universalis, like your compatriot uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, don't, don't laugh at me. I'm too no, old for that. No, at all. <laughs> I, 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 I'm a big fan of da Vinci and of yours. And uh, well, I, I will ask a last question. You, you live in uh, Le Mans, in a, in a town in uh, no, northern or northwest of France. And talk about, you know, just epigrammatically in a few sentences, talk to, talk to, to us about Le Mans. Well, everybody thinks it's the way they make the, the 24 hours and they eat riette, which is something uh, quite not very low protein, is small pieces of pig. Uh, cooked for one day in their own fat. So, but it's much more than that. First of all, 24 hour, we have the one that the Ferrari won this year, this is the classic one, but we have three more. Uh, the, the motto, the old cars, but the best one is the trucks. So, the trucks. The trucks. Oh, the big, big trucks. Wow like all full of colors like christmas trees so this this is very amazing and it's um it's something around which the part of the city lives uh it's not trendy huh? it's very it's very popular then um there is one of the best cathedrals in france that was elected as the best cathedral in france in france two weeks ago it's not probably the best, but this says that we love it. So everybody bought it. And there is a, an ancient Plantagenet um, city in which some of you saw the old version of the, the movie Cyrano de Bergerac uh, that was that was turned mostly in Le Mans. So it's a, it's a charming place. Where on Saturday evening, Saturday afternoon, I meet my my friends that are that have a small art gallery, an old antique bookshop, do Byzantine icons in the street. If it's nice, we we drink something together in the street. If it's rainy, we jump from one side to the other. We are not far from Paris, but we are a little city in the countryside, so come and visit us. It's beautiful. Oh, perfect. So 
Folks, I'd like to thank uh, Georgina Piccoli for this amazing interaction on nutrition in chronic kidney disease. It seems that it is a very important issue that we might go further in other podcasts in the future. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Please check our other episodes already available on Spotify, YouTube, and other platforms. And stay tuned for the new ones, which will be released every second Thursday of the month, starting from January. Take care. Eat well. Have fun.